Uh, all right, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's actually a great pleasure to have Dave back. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, many years ago, uh, Dave was faculty here working on quantum algorithms and quantum error correction. Uh, Dave now leads the software team uh, of the quantum computing effort at Google. And uh, he's going to tell us today about uh, whether quantum computers can beat regular computers. <laughs> All right. Thanks, James. Uh, so it's great to be back here. Uh, uh, like James said, I, I lead the software team uh, and Google's quantum computing efforts. Uh, and I was here uh, 2005 to 2011. So it's great to be back. Uh, some things happen, like we all grow up. Uh, this is my son, Maxwell, uh, Maxwell Bacon. Uh, as a physicist, it's a good name. Uh, and this is what he looked like when I was in the department. And he has the CSE shirt you can see there. And now he's turned into a Jedi Knight, which is awesome. And uh, it's great to see that you guys have also graduated from department to school, which is very similar. I won't show similar pictures for me, what I looked like back then, and me, what I look like now. And I'm not going to show pictures of you guys either. <laughs> so, OK, so it's an exciting time for quantum computing. Uh, I first started doing quantum computing in 1999. Uh, which is a long time ago, uh, but we're going through a hype cycle, which is both good and bad. Uh, but I pulled this off a recent tweet that came out, which I really liked. So this is a picture of, uh, of Sundar, Google's uh, CEO, being bitten by a quantum computer. Uh, and apparently when you get bitten by a quantum computer, you become the CEO also of Alphabet. Uh, so I thought this was a good joke. And also I, it made me think what happens when you get bitten by a quantum computer which is that uh, you gain a superpower, which is that you can efficiently factor numbers really fast. So next time you run into Sundar, ask him this. Uh, OK, so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, work that Google's been doing over the past uh, five-ish years. Uh, this is part of a major team effort. I am just a small part of this team. Here's part of our group, uh, uh, a picture from down in uh, Venice uh, when we had our setup. And, um, these are the people who are really responsible for running this amazing experiment that I'm going to talk about. So all the credit should be given to them. Uh, Google's effort, just to sort of orient to you, is in sort of three locations right now. We have the main effort, which is a hardware uh, effort, which is in Santa Barbara. So uh, John Martinez, who is a professor at UCSB, got hired by Google about five years ago. Uh, and moved his lab and his postdocs and graduate students to Google. Uh, and so in a nondescript you know, uh, building in Santa Barbara, there is a uh, quantum computing, uh, you know, laboratory and facilities uh, that are, which is where most of our experiments are run. Uh, and then we have a group of uh, theorists and algorithm developers who are in Venice in the Google LA office. And then up here in Seattle, we have a small outpost, which is uh, my team up here doing sort of the software. So what are we trying to do at Google? What are our two main focuses? Well. The, the two main focuses are, one, are developing the quantum hardware, right? So we really want to actually take the hardware and push it into the new spaces it needs to get to make quantum computers useful. Um, and then we're also focusing on trying to develop useful algorithms uh, that leverage this, this hardware in some way. So these are our two sort of uh, main goals that we're pushing right now. We're not trying to sell quantum computers really right now. We just want to sort of see what we can do, uh, which is kind of a nice thing to, to actually be in a space where that's what you're trying to do. Um, so for those of you who don't know much about quantum computing, I'll go and give a quick brief overview in, in a second. Uh, but the basic idea goes back to, to ideas that Feynman and Benioff and other people had uh, in the early 80s, which is just this observation that, um, that uh, nature obeys the laws of quantum physics. And therefore, you could try to think about a theory of computation that also obeys the laws of quantum physics. Uh, and this is a quote that's... That's great because, first of all, it's Feynman, so Feynman liked to square, and so it's got, you know, nature isn't classical, damn it, which he could say because he was Feynman. Uh, and if you want to make a simulation in nature, you better make it quantum mechanical, and it's a good problem because it doesn't look so easy. And so this was sort of the first insight that building computers that obey the laws of quantum physics might be an interesting thing to do. Um, so, uh, uh, that original work was sort of just this idea. It's very theoretical, like we know the laws of physics, we can try to think about how to build computing systems with them. But the real thing that ignited the field, and really I'm sort of the, an offspring of the first generation of quantum computing people, was this discovery by Peter Shore in 1994 uh, that quantum computers could efficiently factor integers. Uh, and 
they could do this uh, in you know, a time which is polynomial, and the best classical algorithms are, are, are not polynomial. Um, and uh, this was sort of, you know, there, it's not a proof that quantum computers are, are better in some way, but it was the first sort of firing shot that said, oh, it looks like the computational complexity of these devices could be different. Um, and Peter is one of these great people. This, this is a recent photo. He's one of these people who appears to be getting more and more eclectic in his look as a function of time. So I love this, new, this photo of him. Uh, very much a crazy genius. So, um, okay, so, so the factoring set off a lot of money uh, and frankly, a lot of money from three letter agencies uh, because uh, factoring integers is you know, important for our crypto systems. The hardness of that is that, you know, a key component of this. Uh, of, the, of, the, of, those, of those crypto systems. So that set off a lot of interesting uh, questions about could you build one of these things? Uh, and sort of an entire new field spun up which basically you know, took everything that you can think of in computation and infor sci information science and put the word quantum in front of it. Um, and the you know, sort of big areas that exist and have existed for many decades now are sort of people trying to build these experimental realizations which tend to come from physics departments. Three examples here are trapped ions, uh, superconducting circuits, which I'll talk about, and defects at di in diamond. Those are the, like, the actual quantum system you're building. And then trying to come up with new algorithms. So interesting new ideas of what you could do with these quantum computers, Did you ha could you have one? Um, so this has sort of a, a, a been a, a vibrant and verb, uh, you know, sort of very exciting field. It's been very theoretical because we don't have large quantum computers. And so this is the question that we really care about in the short term, right, is can we build real quantum computers which outperform today's classical computers in some form? This is the big question that we've been starting to chase for many years, but have really focused on at Google for say the last three to four years. Um, so the way this is, uh, you know, so, so there's a real question, like can you do this? Uh, and there's actually a lot of reasons to be doubtful that this is possible, right? So the problem is, is that quantum computers are very fragile, the quantum information likes to become classical, uh, and it's very hard to control these quantum systems. You know, you're sort of thinking about it controlling the states of individual atoms very precisely, and that's very challenging. Um, we, we know that, that to build these quantum computers, we actually need to scale up the system in a way uh, that is very different than just doing sort of small scale experiments on single or few qubit systems. So we have to build a system that like works while everything is going on in parallel, and that's extremely challenging. And then there's just this sort of fundamental question, like it might be that we've never tested quantum mechanics where we have a system of 50 qubits and they're all behaving quantum mechanically as we expect. It may be that quantum mechanics breaks down Right? And this is really a real possibility. There's, you know, there's a lot of mystery about how quantum mechanics can work at all, and we have this sort of world that's not described by quantum mechanics, or doesn't appear to be our classical world, and there's a reason to think that, well, maybe it just breaks down at some size, a uh, number of qubits that you have in your system. So maybe there's new physics for us to discover, which is also a really um, useful way, you know, why we should build it, because if that's true, you know, we'll have figured out something new about the laws of physics, which would be awesome. So uh, when I left the field of, of quantum computing, I left in 2011, I went off and became a real software engineer. Uh, I, of all things, I built a domain registrar. So if you ever use Google domains, you can thank me. <laughs> uh, uh, but when I left, one of the things we didn't really know was people were starting to build larger computers, but we hadn't really defined what it meant to to do something that was beyond sort of the classical computers. And around that time, people were starting to think about what could I do with a very small quantum computer? Was there anything interesting? And John Preskill sort of turned this into a challenge, which, which he calls quantum supremacy. I apologize for the name. He's apologized for the name, I think, effectively. Uh, today's world, we shouldn't really say. Supremacy has some other connotations, which we shouldn't, won't talk about, especially on today of all days. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, um, he posed this problem of, you know, is there a point where we can finally do some task, any task, it doesn't matter what it is, that we can do on a quantum computer, but which we can't do on a classical computer, meaning we, we can't do it in some reasonable amount of time. And this is a really kind of wishy-washy thing in the sense of like, we know sort of from the theory of quantum computation and classical computation that everything a quantum computer we 
can do, we can do it on a classical computer. We might just take a long amount of time. But it's sort of this question about can we get to the point where there's a race between these things and one of the, the quantum computer is outperforming and we can sort of see that as we scale the size of our quantum computer or the, the size of the quantum computation it's doing, all of a sudden the classical computer just starts falling behind. And that's what he has called quantum supremacy. The way he likes to phrase this also is not just, you know, uh, you know getting to this thing, but the way he likes to talk about it is um, one of the worries you might have about quantum computation is that it's, 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 it's actually ridiculously hard. And what he wants to know is sort of like, is controlling these large quantum systems really, really hard or is it ridiculously hard? Is there some real, real reason that we can't even scale up to 50 qubits? And we didn't really know this uh, in sort of this 2012 time frame. Okay, so now let me just quickly do a sort of quantum computing 101 to just sort of frame for you the, the things I'm gonna talk about which will help you understand how Google's quantum computer works, which will then help you understand what the supremacy task was. And then finally, I'll talk about the actual results and actually this sort of demonstration of quantum supremacy. Okay, so uh, quantum, uh, quantum computers work on qubits. Uh, a, a physical model that you might have in your head if you're a physicist is the spin of an electron, which can point in one of two directions. That's, even though it's not really pointing, they'll say up and down. So it has two states. So, sort of when you look at this, this, uh, this, this spin, uh, you will find that it's in one of these two states when you, when you look at it. It'll be in one of these two states. Um, but a qubit uh, uh, is, you know, that's the physical realization of it. When we want to actually describe the quantum physics of it, we actually have to have a, a different representation of that. Uh, and that representation is the wave function of the qubit. And in the case of a single qubit, you have these sort of two complex numbers, C0 and C1, describing what we call the amplitude to be in zero and the amplitude to be in one. So these amplitudes are complex numbers. They're not real numbers, so that's a little bit weird. Uh, and they have an interpretation, which is that if you take the absolute value squared of those complex numbers, you get the probability that you'll see zero and one. So if you prepare a system in a particular state and then make a measurement and then repeat that whole process multiple times and eventually take statistics, you'll see that when the, when the system has that description of these two complex numbers, you'll get those probabilities. That's the, the pictures you have. That's our description of the system. But when we measure it, you remember, we only ever see zero or one. So qubits become bits when we look at them. So that's a quantum bit. There's another representation which is helpful for what I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit, which is what people call the block sphere representation. And that is these, these complex numbers, because they're, because when you square them, they have to equal to one. There's really only sort of three free parameters. And you can think about those, or there's only the parameters, there's actually two parameters because it's a global phase, but you can think about these as, as pointing in a particular direction. And this actually has a physical realization for an electron, electric, electron spin. It actually is sort of like the electrons pointing up or down. And when you rotate the system, you actually do a rotation on this, this block sphere. So in this picture, this, this, this wave function is just a point in some direction. And we'll need that when we talk about manipulating them. Okay, so now that's one qubit. One qubit's boring. There's nothing exciting about one qubit, in my opinion. <laughs> what is interesting is when you have multiple qubits. Uh, and, you know, as you scale the number of bits, the number of configurations grows exponentially, just like in the classical world, right? One bit, it can be either zero or one. Two bits can be in four different possibilities, right? And the, the number of configurations you can be in grows exponentially. The interesting thing is, is that to describe the quantum system when you do this, you will need uh, you know, a growing number of complex numbers to describe the amplitudes to be in each of those configurations. Um, so, you know, for one qubit, you just have two numbers, and then for two qubits, you'll need four numbers, et cetera. And in some ways, you know, this is not the, the proper way to say it, but in some ways you start to see that the amount of information you need to describe this system grows exponentially. Now that by itself doesn't mean anything because if, if you think about it for a little while, you'll realize that probabilistic systems, if you just have a bunch of probabilities, they also require, you'd have to describe, you know, and you have n bits, you need two to the n different probabilities. And so it's very similar. The weird thing is gonna end up being that these systems don't behave like probabilistic systems, they have these complex amplitudes. So this is sort of where uh, we can now talk about, th those are our systems, that's how we describe them. Now how do you actually build a quantum computation? So here, just like in everything in quantum computing, we just take the word quantum and shove it in front of, of every word that you have. Uh, so just like we have logical gates that manipulate our bits, we could have bit flip gates or AND gates or OR gates, we have, uh, we have quantum logic gates. 
And for this talk, we just need sort of two of them. We need single qubit gates and two qubit gates. So a single qubit gate is, is the way to think about it on that representation is you have some qubit, which is in some state, and then you apply some physical operation like shine light on it, or we'll talk about what we do in our experiment in a second. And what that does is it ends up, ends up rotating that state. Okay, and that's a unitary rotation. So it's a, it's just a, it's a, I guess it's orthogonal, but it's a, it's a rotation that just preserves angles of these, of these, of these different state vectors. So literally, you have a qubit. You can apply a gate to it. It'll change those amplitudes in a particular way corresponding to this rotation. And then we have two qubit gates. Uh, for this talk, I'll just focus on. There's just a couple of easy ones. There's a control knot, so it's exactly sort of what you think about. You have a control line coming in, a bit coming in, another bit here. If this bit's zero. It doesn't do anything to the qubit down here. If this bit's one, it applies the X operation, which flips the bit down here. So controlled on this, it does a not. That's the controlled not gate. Uh, and then there's another gate that we use pretty regularly, which is called the square root of I swap. So if you had a, uh, in, the, in our normal world, we could do you know, a gate that takes the two qubits and runs them across. It doesn't, doesn't do anything to them. Or it could swap their locations. The square root of swap essentially does a little bit of amplitude to just do that straight through and a little bit of amplitude to swap. That's the square root of swap gate. That doesn't exist uh, classically. It's sort of an only quantum mechanical type of uh, gate. Okay, so let's put this together to have the components we need to talk about our device and about supremacy. We have a physical representation, which could be an atom, it could be an electron. Uh, you'll see we have superconducting circuits. There's an abstract representation of that, which is a wave function, which grows you know, the number of, of amplitudes grows exponentially. Uh, and then there's this series of manipulations we can do to that quantum information. And for, for this talk, these will just be single qubit operations and two qubit operations. And we put these together in a quantum logic circuit. And I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, when we actually get to that. At the end of the day, you have these qubits. You do some operations to them. The qubits are fixed here, and we're just like shining lasers to do these crazy interactions. At the end of the day, we make a measurement. We only ever get out classical bits, zeros and ones, but these classical bits come out with some probability distribution. So you prepare your states in some, some, some way by probably by cooling your system down. You shine these lasers at it and do these manipulations. You make a measurement, and you get out probabilities of the different outcomes, zeros and ones. And from that, you run, you use that as your primitive to run a different algorithm, or in our case, this supremacy task. Okay, so that's the model of quantum computation. Why is it interesting? The main reason it's interesting is because quantum computations, uh, you know, one thing that you'll hear is that quantum computers do operations in parallel universes, which is actually, I don't even know what that means, really. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also, it's kind of boring because it does, it's not just about splitting universes that's interesting because we only exist in one universe. When we make a measurement, we only see zeros and ones. Uh, but the interesting thing is that quantum computers can sort of merge back universes, right? And so this is uh, one way to think about it is you have a computation that's uh, unfolding in sort of space time. And normally, in probabilistic computations, you can sort of sum over the different paths, but they're all positive things that you sum to. But because these were complex numbers for our wave functions, we can actually have interference where we have sort of some positive contribution on one, one path and a negative one on the other, and they can cancel out. And so then that path doesn't occur even though it's sort of tried to go through it halfway through. And then it can also do the opposite, which can constructively interfere and add up more than it should. And somehow that type of computation in space time appears to be more powerful than our classical model of, of computation. Okay, so now let me talk about Google's approach. This picture here is a picture of the Sycamore device, which is what we ran our supremacy experiment on. Uh, there's lots of different approaches to picking qubits. They all have different trade-offs, pluses or minuses. Uh, the ones that are sort of naturally occurring, which are really nice, are electrons. It has a spin that's up or down, or an atom, which has different energy levels. And you can use those energy levels, like lowest energy level zero, first excited state is one. You can use those energy levels as you're sort of storing your qubits. What we do instead is sort of build an artificial atom. Um, so we have silicon, and then we put aluminum on top of it, uh, and we build uh, a superconducting electrical circuit. So these are just like your normal circuits in your, in your everyday electronics and computers, except they're superconducting, so there's no resistance. Uh, the systems are cooled down to, say, 10 to 15 millikelvin, uh, so very, very cold. Uh, and because you cool them down, they enter in, they condense into this superconducting state uh, that allows that whole state to behave as a quantum mechanical object. 
So the interesting thing that you might not know, you might think, oh, these, these are very small things. They're not. This is about a half a millimeter. You can't quite distinguish this type of qubits just with your naked eye, but a very low-powered microscope, you can easily see this. So they're actually pretty big. Okay, so that's one of the advantages that, that we have in some sense right now. When we're dealing with few numbers of qubits, it's actually kind of nice that they're big. Uh, it turns out that because they're big, it's easy to control. We can get in our control wires into these big things, whereas when you have ions, you have to shoot lasers at them, and you have to precisely target that laser. Or if you have electrons and quantum dots, they're very small, and it's hard to get your wiring in. So it's kind of nice that they're big because we can get the wiring into them. The other interesting thing is that we can, these are electrical circuits. They have capacitances, inductances, and then this other thing, a, a nonlinear inductance, which I'll mention in a second. But we can basically, by changing the, you know, just the shapes of basically everything involved in the circuit, we can change the properties of these qubits and change their sort of spectrum and how they behave. So it's very easy to engineer these, these uh, uh, quantum mechanical electrical cir circuits. The other thing is, is these are built like a normal computer chip. So that's great because, you know, the uh, people have been building computer chips for a long time. We have a lot of existing tooling and information about how to do this, and that actually is kind of an advantage because we can just leverage that and not have to invent new technologies to sort of do some of our basic <laughs> stuff. So the qubit we, we, we use is called a transmon qubit. Uh, there was a very big discovery in 2007 uh, by the Yale group of a way to build. Prior to that, there was a debate in superconducting qubits about which was the best qubit. Prior to that, everybody built transmons. After this event, everybody built transmons. So transmons are, are particularly nice design of a qubit that's not as sensitive to charge noise. Um, so this is a picture of one of these transmons. The, the interesting thing here is that's the circuit diagram on the right, uh, essentially. It's a, very, a simplified version. You recognize the capacitance, right? Um, but you might not recognize the other symbol. Those are Josephson junctions. So these are superconducting circuits, right? So no resistance. But uh, Joseph injunctions, you put a little insulating layer in between uh, these superconductors. And the electron wave function, or the Cooper pair wave function, can kind of tunnel across this. And because of that, you can get what we call a nonlinear um, inductance. And that allows us to build a nonlinear oscillator. And you know, there's a lot of some, uh, fun physics math here you can do. But that allows us to build a qubit that we can tune its properties. So with our qubits, we end up designing a qubit that has uh, you know, the sort of zero state is as is, 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 is you can think about it as there's sort of no, uh, no current moving at all in the circuit. And then the, the excited state is some amount of current moving in some way. And we designed these qubits so they have about a 6 gigahertz oscillation frequency. So uh, we can sort of adjust these things and fabricate them. And then we can get their, their frequencies to be about 6 gigahertz. Uh, and we have the ability to actually adjust that frequency over some range using some of our control knobs. Okay, so for the transon qubit, how do you do qubit? How do you go back to that model? We have these single qubit gates and these two qubit gates. What are single qubit gates? Um, the single qubit gates, you see this big thing over here. There's a, a wire that's coming in from the side. That's our drive line. Um, this is the thing that's coming in, and we're going to shoot microwaves down into the system. Uh, and those microwaves are actually going to uh, do a manipulation on the qubit. So sort of what ends up happening is the area under that pulse and the phase of that, those oscillations actually influences exactly which operation we do. So we have to very precisely control that volume, that area under that pulse, and also the phase of that, that waveform that's coming in. And we sh so we can basically shoot those in, and then once we've done that, we've done some single qubit gate. Okay, readout is the thing that's at the top. We have this big readout resonator. So it's, uh, it's just like a, so it's a, you know, a place where we can sort of store our microwave phon photon pho photons in some ways. Uh, and what we're really doing here is we're going to drive, we're going to shoot a microwave down at that resonator. And then we watch how it interacts with the qubit. And what we'll see is the phase of the outcoming wave that we get depending on whether the qubit was in state zero or one, changes. And we can discriminate between these two states. So this is sort of a picture of one of our things where we, we're trying to, we start the, the, we cool our system down. And we know that it's sort of in the ground state. And we're trying to prepare it really high probability in the ground state. Uh, and then we can take a bunch of data and see where the phases sort of end up. And then we can do a thing where we do a single qubit gate that excites it up to its highest state. 
and then we can run the same thing with shooting our microwaves past this resonator, and we get a different phase, and we can kind of discriminate these two, um, these two clouds between these two different states. I like showing this one because it just reminds me of every plot I've ever seen in machine learning. But <laughs> Okay, so then how do we get two qubit gates? Two qubit gates in this system here, in the traditional design of the transmon qubit, you have capacitively coupled qubits. So you basically have the two qubits and then they're brought close to each other and there's a capacitance between them. And how we actually do the, the operations then is each of these qubits is like a, you know, like a pendulum, like a ball on a spring with a certain frequency. And we can tune those frequencies. And so the traditional way to do gates in the transmon qubits is you bring the frequencies of those qubits basically in resonance with each other. And at that point, that capacitive coupling can then, can then swash back and forth that quantum information and perform a two qubit gate. Um, this, is, this is the one video that I have in here. It's sort of like the, these coupled pendulums here where you see that the energy is in one and then there's a coupling between it and oscillates back to the other. You can, so you can sort of imagine how that sort of oscillation back and forth is the sloshing back and forth of the quantum, quantum information. I also like that there's a guitar in the back of this because of course. Um, okay, so uh, one of the things, so, so there's sort of lots of different things you can do for these types of qubits. One thing to do is to try to actually do these control not gates. Another thing is to do these sort of half swap gates, these square root of swap gates that I talked about. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more in, in, in a bit. The qubits we use are not exactly like this. This is the more traditional transmon qubit. We essentially add another bad qubit in some sense and between those, it allows us to turn on and off that capacitance coupling. That means we can really turn off interactions when we don't need them. And it also allows us to really precisely control that interaction and allows us to get really good two qubit gates. Okay, so why is it hard to build a quantum computer? Uh, well, there's a fundamental thing going on here, which is that we really, uh, you know, we need to have a quantum objects. So one thing to remember is superconducting circuits, like I said, these are pretty mic macroscopic looking objects. It's pretty amazing that when these things become superconducting, they still maintain their quantum properties. So there's a big debate in the 80s and 90s about whether this was actually a quantum effect. But these collective states of a large number of, of electrons that have condensed into this state behave as a quantum object. That's actually kind of amazing. Um, but there's a tension, which is that we'd like to be able to control our qubits precisely, and we need to bring in the sort of wires that do this and can shoot in our electronics. But every time we do that, we're coupling to, they, they can behave as an environment as well, right? They can behave as something that's noisy. Our system will couple to those wires, and that's bad. Um, and so there's sort of this trade-off between we really want to isolate our qubits so that they, they don't interact with their environments because that causes them to become classical, but we also want to be able to control them precisely. So there's sort of a tension going on there. So to do this, there's a lot of techniques that you have to master. Uh, some of them start very small just with your materials, right? So you need clean surfaces and components, and that sounds easy, just wash it off. I'm a software engineer, uh, right? Like, sounds easy, but it's not, right? There's a lot of different techniques you need to do in the fabrication and maintaining your system and growing things correctly in some sense. There's a lot of cool things you need to do. You're trying to manipulate these quantum systems. You need to do fabrication that can not damage your qubits at the same time. So we have sort of cool things where we built these bridges across here that help us build the system that don't destroy the qubits good properties while we're shooting all these electrical pulses down into them. Uh, the system itself here is an example. This is from a few years back. It doesn't have many qubits. I think this may have been at UCSB and not at Google. Oh, well, does it have Google on the, you can usually tell if it's at Google because we put, make them put a little stamp that says Google on it, but this must be at UCSB. Uh, we actually have a thing where we have the control electronics uh, circuits or circuitry sort of sits on one chip and then the qubits themselves with these Josephson junctions and the capacitive coupler sit on another and we bond them, we basically take them together. Each of these little, those little white things is a, is a little tiny uh, little nodule thing and you basically take them together and squish them, right? And amazingly that works. You can build a system where you bump on these things on top of each other and it's really nice to have a separation from the control uh, from the actual qubits in terms of the behavior of the qubits themselves and just in terms of getting the wires into the system. The next step in sort of thinking about building the system up is we have these chips, they're fabricated, we bump on them, and now we actually have to de design special packaging uh, to do this, and this sounds mundane, it sounds boring, uh, but it turns out it's like one of the most important challenging things to do to build this because you want your system to be very well isolated from anything in the outside world. 
Uh, and so we spent a lot of effort on doing that. The team likes to joke that the paper we published in Nature on the Cerise experiment, the first author is a packaging engineer. So that's how important it is, right? So also it's great to have uh, A in your name. Um, Okay, so we have this, this fabricated device. We stick it in the packaging, and then this thing goes into a dilution refrigerator. So this is an opened dilution refrigerator. Uh, the dilution refrigerator, refrigerator, this thing's about a meter across, this picture here. What you see is all the control wiring come in. The chip is not in this picture. It's actually, it's mounted down there. Um, and then there's different stages. This lowest stage is five millikelvin, so they like to say colder than space. Uh, I wouldn't like to stick my head neither in space or into the Lucian refrigerator. It's very, very cold. Uh, and then there's sort of like higher temperature phases all the way up to room temperature. Uh, and I was asking James, what does this picture remind you of? Uh, well, for me, it looks like a lot of spaghetti. So we had a group meeting the other day, and I, we happened to have spaghetti. So I got a picture of myself eating spaghetti in front of the spaghetti monster machine. Uh, but that's actually that painting. That picture I had on the first slide is actually a painting of this open dilution refrigerator, which is a pretty amazing painting. OK, so at Google, we've been working on building this thing over the last three to five years. It's awesome because it, it requires engineering uh, all the way from you know, nanometers up to meters, cryogenic systems. Like it really is uh, all, almost all this stuff we have to build. You know, we don't build the dilution refrigerator from, from scratch ourselves, but we have to modify it in particular ways that are useful for us. Al almost all of the stuff we end up doing is very custom. Uh, so literally, like the group that I have, you know, if World War III breaks out, I'm taking them into the mountains with me, like in Red Dawn, because they can build a normal computer from scratch because they're building it for the quantum world. So it's, it's an awesome uh, endeavor. So the path that we've taken is uh, in 2018, we built a chip called Bristlecone. Uh, this, cu this, this device had 72 qubits. Uh, and this was our first, uh, and then 144 control knobs, so 144 wires coming into this. This was our first chip where we were trying to run an entire quantum computation on a huge number of qubits. It was the first one where we had scaled. Previously, you'll see a lot of the quantum computing papers had qubits that were sort of all in a line, or maybe a line that was too wide. This is the first one where we scaled in both directions and trying to run this all simultaneously. And we were having actually pretty good success with this. Um, but we also learned a lot from this, this uh, initial design. Uh, and we slightly pivoted because we came up with essentially a better qubit design. Uh, this, this new processor, the Sycamore processor, has uh, less qubits. So it has 54. We were shooting for 54 qubits, but one of the qubits was not behaving. Uh, and so we ended up with 53 qubits. Uh, this thing has way more control knobs because now essentially, instead of having control knobs for the qubits and the, qubi two, the, the qubits themselves only, we also added a control line for every coupler in the system. And that allows us to turn those couplers on and off. And what's great about that is when you're doing a quantum computation, one of the biggest problems is if you're doing something here, you're shooting microwaves into the system, it interacts with something over here, right, crosstalk. And by being able to turn things on and off, we're able to better isolate our systems and get that crosstalk down to very negligible amounts. Okay, so we put this all together and uh, we can build a, a, uh, a quantum computer using these parts. So let me describe to you a little bit now about the challenge of, of, of actually getting this thing, that's sort of the fit, that's sort of the, I've just showed you all the parts that we put together to build this thing, right? And the Sycamore chips at the bottom of it. Uh, let's talk now about actually programming this thing. So previously we had this picture uh, of a quantum circuit. So we have a bunch of qubits here, which are you know the labeled on the left, and then times running from left to right, and then this is like a musical score, right? You're reading this as the the operations you want to perform on your qubits that do these particular manipulations of the quantum information. So we have these single qubit gates, y square root of x, and then some two qubit gates. These are probably controlled phase gates, but they could be some other gate. They could be whatever we're trying to actually do. OK, so uh, that's sort of the abstract representation. This is the score of music, right? Like you're trying to play that, that, that score. Um, but what's really going on here is that's the score that we have stored, say, in our com classical computer, and we're going to try to run it. What we really have is we have an audience like you guys, and you guys are like, uh, you guys are like the, the qubits in the sense that you will respond to certain instruments, right? Like I might be a violin and I play, and Ed really likes violins, and so he gets really excited, right? And so 
what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that abstract score uh, and then we're trying to use some instruments, which I'll just describe in a second, that will send out the instructions to the qubits. And then the qubits are quantum information. They can only be zeros and ones. They're ever, only ever going to give us feedback of like thumbs up and thumbs down. Okay, so the control of electronics we build are all custom electronics. Uh, again, more spaghetti. These are all the wires coming out of a rack on the right-hand side. Uh, these things have to be high speed. Remember those frequencies of the qubits were like gigahertz, so we need to be faster than that. Uh, they have to be high precision. We're trying to really engineer our waveforms, and they're pretty much all custom built. Um, and that means you run into things that you hadn't thought about. Like we've had a couple times where one dilution refrigerator's electronics were talking to the other dilution refrigerator's uh, electronics, and you run the experiment where you turn one off, and then all of a sudden everything breaks in the other one. You're like, oh shoot, really? Um, so they're very sensitive, uh, and you have to be very careful in building these uh, in a in a way that doesn't, you know, that produces really high precision. Uh, isolated controls. Okay, so back to this analogy. The note, right, in the, in, the, in the orchestra is then played by an instrument which produces sound waves which are going to manipulate the qubits, which are going to manipulate the audience for the, for the music. The quantum gates are the same thing. The quantum gate is the note that you want to play, which then gets into our control electronics, uh, which have, you know, high, uh, you know, high speed uh, FPGAs along with uh, things that produce the waveforms, and these produce, you know, going out of these wires, electrical microwave pulses that then get sent down into the dilution refrigerator into this chip. Okay, so why is controlling these systems hard? Well, what we're really doing is we have these, we have this precise control equipment. We can go and measure what it's actually doing, right, at the room temperature, but we can't go and put a listening device at our qubits. We can't stick a something that's monitoring something at that low temperature uh, as these sort of get sent down into this fridge at our qubit. We can't figure out exactly what's going on there. So really, we can't listen to the to what we you know these waves get sent into the dilution fridge. They end up going down to the qubit and doing something to the qubit. We can't actually hear what's going on. What we get back is the result of those measurements. We shoot in some other pulses that change phase, right? And those that change of phase tells us something about the state of the qubit. And we have to sort of then infer from that what this qubit actually heard. So this calibration, uh, 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 this, this, this system of bringing up a system where we have all this control electronics with a huge parameter space and we're trying to actually figure out how to control these precisely, it's extremely challenging. Um, this is a part of a sequence for just tuning up two qubits in our device. Each of these nodes is essentially a physics experiment that we're running to tune up something, uh, different device parameters, and it's a lot of bootstrapped information that physicists in the, the in, you know, across many groups, not just ours, have learned about building these systems. Um, so to do 53 qubits, we actually have sort of thousands of these experiments that are run to calibrate this device. Um, one of the jokes uh, that one of our team members likes to make when he shows this slide is that literally his PhD thesis was these two nodes. <laughs> Right, so this encapsulates a lot of information about how to bring these things up. The cool thing is, as a Google software engineer, this is an amazing system where you have all these knobs that you're trying to tune and manipulate to get an end result, an objective function, which is pretty clear. And I suspect as a function of time, we'll see this shrink and a lot of knowledge gained in how to build these types of calibration systems. Okay, so over the past few years, we've been working on that control. We've, we've gotten it all working. What happens with the Sycamore device? Well, what we need to quantify is how, how much, how often it sort of fails, right? Uh, and so we quantify that in terms of the, the, the error rates for our single qubit gates failing and our two qubit fail gates failing. The quantum information in, in the systems we have eventually does interact with its environment and decohere. The time scales for that are like uh, 10 uh, microseconds. They're long enough that that's not the dominant effect of what's interfering with our computer. Well, the dominant effect is that we're trying to send in these pulses to do these precise manipulations and we don't do exactly what we think we're doing. Um, so the error rates we end up achieving are 0.16% for single qubit gates and 0.62% for two qubit gates. And then the readout itself fails with about a 4% probability. These are nowhere near record uh, rates. People in ion traps have gotten uh, way better single qubit gates, for example. Superconducting people have also done way better than this in isolated systems. But that's the real trick here. This is, uh, these numbers are for doing these one and two qubit gates, but also doing them all at the same time. So running sort of a bunch of two qubit gates across the entire device and looking at how well one of them is performing. So this captures that crosstalk 
between the system uh, as one of the parts of this, of this contribution. And that's the real challenging thing is engineering a system where you can do it all at once. Because um, we need to sort of have a very massively parallel single qubits and then two qubits to get a quantum computer to work. Uh, the good thing about our design for this uh, Sycamore, except for that one lousy qubit up the top, is that each qubit is connected to multiple qubits. Uh, and this ability to turn on and off the interactions is really useful because in our previous designs, because we couldn't do that, if we did a two qubit gate, we couldn't really do anything with the other qubits that were adjacent to it at the same time. We could if we had worked really hard, uh, but we're lazy. Uh, and it turned out that just because we can now turn these couplers off, it means that we can involve those other qubits into other gates. And that means we can pack more computation in a given slice of time. So that was a major improvement in the sort of amount of, of quantum computation we can pack into this. Yeah? The faulty bit up there, an unexpected design flaw, a fab flaw? Uh, I don't remember which one it was. We often have, it's, it's, it's likely it's actually the wiring. That's usually the culprit in this case right now. The wiring can be bad. Uh, it could be that it, was, that it was actually a bad fabrication. Uh, and it could have been that just sometimes there are qubits that the design parameters, the fabrication tolerance was not enough, and somehow the frequency, we couldn't get it into a rough frequency range that's not enough. I don't remember what it is in this case, actually. We see all of those in different things. Um, I think this was maybe, I, I do remember this was, you know, a, we didn't have to do a ton of generations to find one like this, which was good. Um, because we can manipulate the frequencies, that's actually really useful. A lot of other designs have fr frequencies for their qubits, and then you have to basically fabricate them and hope you don't have frequency collisions, and that's more dangerous. Um, okay, so, so that's the Sycamore device. Let's talk now about that thing I talked about at the beginning, which is the quantum supremacy task. Um, so here's a game, which is an analogy. It's a direction game. So you are centered in some place on a map. You have a starting location that I give you, and then I randomly pick out uh, you know, instructions for you, like walk 100 feet, turn 47 degrees, you know, just like in, Lo nope, you guys probably don't even know Logo. Man, I'm an old man, right? So, so just like Logo, the programming language, where you have a turtle that moves around. But I'm randomly giving you these instructions, and then the goal is to get as close to possible to the precise location. So using Google Maps, I can, you know, write some stuff on my, on my, on my desktop at work, and I can actually figure out where you should end up. And your goal now is to actually follow those instructions and end up as close as possible, okay? So that's, that's, a, that's a game of directions. The quantum supremacy task is like that. We have some starting coordinates, which just means we start our qubits in a particular state. Uh, almost always it's like all in the ground state because that's the easiest thing to get to. And then we send a bunch of, of quantum directions to the, to, the, to the circuit, right? These are what we would like to do. Um, so some single qubit gates and some two qubit gates. Again, these are drawn at random, right? Uh, and then the goal is, at the end of that, if I had a classical computer, I could calculate what the actual, or just, you know, for two qubit gate, two gates like this, I can write down as a homework problem in my quantum mechanics, I can figure out what the final wave function is, right? And the goal is, you know, if I have that what final wave function, and if I measure it, I'll get out probabilities. And the goal is to build your quantum computer such that it's good enough to whatever random things that I've told you to do, that you get the same probability distribution, right? So you, you run this thing, you start your qubits in a fixed state, you apply random elements of either single qubit gates or two qubit gates, you apply those in time, and classically we could figure out like, oh, you know, uh, we could actually calculate that, what that wave function is at the end and figure out what the probability distribution is. The quantum computer we run and try to get as close as possible, and that closeness is a fidelity score. We don't actually use fidelity, we use cross entropy, uh, but, in, in effect, these are very similar to each other for a lot of sort of technical reasons that are, if people cost me about them, I'll try to explain them, but I actually don't understand them perfectly well. Uh, but that, but that there is sort of a good reason to just say fidelity here. Um, okay, so this, this problem is not that hard in the sense of like, uh, for the classical computer, right? For a couple qubits, you just need four numbers. These gates are just little tiny matrices that you multiply. You know, I, like I said, I can probably do this by hand, right? I don't even need a computer. When you start getting up to five qubits, you might need to use a computer to do this. Your wave function now needs two to the five numbers. It starts to scale more and more. The challenge of quantum simulation for this problem is as it scales more and more, you need to have, you know, 
uh, a larger and larger state space, one way to do it is to keep track of all those amplitudes. And by the time you get to, you know, uh, two to the three, two to the 53, you have to keep track of a huge number of numbers in order to, to do this simulation. And at some point, the classical algorithm that's doing this starts to become harder and harder to do. Okay. So yeah, so two to the 53 is nine quadrillion amplitudes. Uh, and again, this game is, uh, right, you're trying to, you're running this, you're, you start your state in this initial state, you run a random circuit, you make a measurement, and you want to see how, you know, does that look like the thing that the classical computer predicted? And you're going to race the classical computer and the quantum computer at this task, right? And the quantum computer, it'll turn out for our circuits, it's always the same amount of time, <laughs> essentially, right? Because, I mean, it's not quite true, but essentially all of the stuff we're going to do in quantum computation will run in under 200 seconds to get all this data to statistical accuracy that we need for these, for, for, for one of these quantum, quantum from one of these quantum circuits. Uh, but the classical one will start to get slower and slower. Okay, when you say there are two randomly chosen quantum circuits, but the, the actual distributions are different, presumably. Yes, yeah. So, so when you look at these, what you, what you see when you actually, if you start just running, you can write a thing on your laptop to actually do this. And this is like a 12 qubit distribution of, of these random circuits. So we have some random circuit and we look at the different probabilities of the different bit springs. And it's not just uniform. It has some where sort of this constructive interference is added up and some where they've interfered. And so you get this, what people call a speckled distribution. It's a Porter Thomas distribution as a uh, a fancy name to just say there's a distribution that starts to appear which is very different from the uniform one. And the goal is, right, that some of these bit strings are more, uh, like, occur more often. Your quantum computer should also show those more often, right? Um, and this is, uh, there's an analogy here with it. If there's a cool experiment you can do with a laser where you'll see the speckle that comes up and that's exactly sort of this constructive and destructive interference. Um, okay, so, the first way we use this, there's sort of two ways we use this. First, we use this as a way to check that our quantum computer is doing what we think it's going to do, right? So like we have what we think we sent, you know, there's the circuit, we think we did that on the quantum computer, we get some probability distribution, we can simulate it classically, and we can compare, right? So, you know, we have the Sycamore, we run it, we get a bunch of bit strings, we can calculate the probability of those bit strings, and then we have a classical computer that we run at the same time or you know, afterwards, we don't have to run at the same time, but that does a similar calculation for that circuit and says which are the most probable ones and do those probability distributions really match up, right? Now, we d the quantum computer doesn't always succeed. It has, you know, measurement outcomes can fail, the single qubit gates, the two qubit gates can fail. So what actually happens is that you don't get exactly the probability distribution from the Sycamore. You get a noisy version of that, right? Uh, and so there's a, a fidelity score that we calculate, and I'll use fidelity, and if, if you're an expert, just you can think cross entropy here. Uh, but what it essentially says is if it was fidelity one, it would mean we're getting exactly the same distribution. They match perfectly. Now, of course, that never happens when you're sampling because you're sampling, so it's t statistical, right? So you'll never ever get that except in a very large limit. But you can imagine that's the limit where we're perfectly matching it. And then fidelity zero means basically that the, the sycamore is just randomly guessing. It's not at all getting this correct. And we, what we want to achieve is, a, you know, sort of a non-zero fidelity that's statistically distinguishable from the zero fidelity and that also doesn't fluctuate, doesn't have systematic effects that fluctuate over time, that we can repeatedly do that. Okay, so, so we want the quantum computer to outperform the classical computer, uh, but, we need, but, but we're sort of stuck in this thing where what we're actually doing in the beginning is just using the classical computer to calculate this fidelity score, right? So what's happening is, uh, we're sort of using the quantum classical computer in this first phase to sort of like, the Sycamore is going to more and more difficult problems. So more qubits, more depth in the circuit that you're doing, more amount of time that you're doing quantum computation. It's getting harder and harder. But as you do that, the fidelity of our quantum processor goes down. And essentially, you eventually hit this thing where the classical computer can't keep up. And that's what we, what we would call entering into the, the supremacy threshold or the supremacy regime. Okay, so, so are there questions about this game? Sort of the game is you have the quantum circuit that's randomly drawn, you run it on the quantum processor, and then you have a classical computer over here that's gonna generate a probability distribution. And for small circuit sizes, you can sort of use it to verify that the quantum computation is going correctly, but eventually you wanna get to a point where the largest computer in the world struggles in actually doing this, running, you know, calculating those, those amplitudes at the end. 
Okay, so there's some questions you might ask. Why uh, random circuit sampling? The reason is basically because it doesn't have any structure, right? And in fact, the structure it has in our system is because the geometric locality of the system. And you'll see that actually the best algorithms actually uh, use that and exploit that effect. Um, the gates that we have here are actually universal, like we're not doing anything that you can't use to run real quantum algorithms. Uh, sometimes there's a perception that it only runs this circuit. That's not true. I actually from my can actually run uh, quantum computations that are totally arbitrary, you know, two qubit gates, this two qubit gate, that two qubit gate, that's totally universal. Um, this system is, is uh, both very sensitive to errors in that a single bit flip sort of destroys that probability of having fidelity one versus zero. But in another sense, it sort of scales nicely with the errors as we grow the system. Uh, and this is a really good system for uh, performance for system benchmarking. You're trying to get this full system to do you know, as much compute as possible, you know, single qubit gates, two qubit gates, as densely as possible. Uh, and that's a good test of your full system operating, not just parts of your system operating independently. But David, your uh, success here basically with a non-trivial probability, you get a good high fidelity. So like a lot of the time you get a crappy fidelity, but but 1% of the time you get fidelity that's non-trivially close to one. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's essentially right. You, 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 I mean, you're taking a ton of samples from these things and you could just think about the distributions you're getting and you can calculate the cross entropy between them and what you see is that there's a non-negligible cross entropy, like the, the you're, start, you're seeing more of the strings that you should be seeing, right? But, it's, but it is true that, you know, a vast majority of the time, you know, like when, we, when you see the fidelities in here, you can kind of think about them as probabilities, like one in a thousand times, it doesn't even, it's, it's you know, it's, getting, it's doing that, but you know, that one in a thousand is enough because then you just run this thing enough to get statistical sampling, right? So, um, so there's a trade-off. One of the things that's going on here is our computer is very fast. Uh, it has a high rep rate. Uh, and so we spend a lot of times working on getting high, like pipelining your circuits in as fast as possible and all your pulses and stuff and running these things at a fast enough rep rate that we can collect a ton of statistics, right? So um, it's pretty awesome. I can run quantum computations from my desk in Seattle that, you know, run a million samples and it, I don't even, you know, blink. That's, that's, that's kind of amazing. Um, okay, so here's what the circuits look like. They're just single qubit gates, two qubit gates. We arrange them in sort of a clever pattern to try to trick some of the best algorithms that people come up to simulate these systems. Um, these are what the circuits look like. Um, and what we do is we, uh, in the end, what we wanna do is run one of these circuits in a way that's very hard for a classical computer to simulate. But we also wanna be sort of confident that the system is still behaving like we think it is. We're gonna go into a regime where we can't verify our quantum computation. We just sort of keep scaling and then eventually we don't have a supercomputer big enough, even Google doesn't, uh, to do this. And we wanna sort of be confident that we're still doing what we think we're doing. Um, in the end, what we'll do is we'll produce the circuit and the probability distribution the quantum computer gets and we'll challenge people to say, can you simulate this efficiently? We couldn't do it using you know, the resources that we had available. So what we end up doing is sort of validating that where our quantum computer is working is we calculate this fidelity for these random circuits as a, a function of the number of qubits, right? So here it's scaling from just above 10, probably 12 up to 53 qubits. Uh, and we're doing this with easy circuits. So why are they easy? It's because we only run for 14 cycles. A cycle is a round of single qubit gates followed by two qubit gates. Okay, so that's a depth of 28. So it turns out that for that, if you're, if you're not that deep, if you don't do your quantum computation for long enough, then there are tricks you can do for simulation which say don't simulate the system this way, essentially. Uh, one trick is to sort of simulate it this way in space time. So your space time is usually like this. You could do it in time. You could sort of turn it on its side and contract the, the network this way. Another thing to do is split the system in half and do sort of simulations that are, uh, that are sort of the normal ones on each half. And then for the stuff that crosses the boundary, you sort of have to add them up afterwards. So these are sort of these tricks that people have learned in sort of simulating these things. So it depends on the cost of the simulation as far as people know for, for these things, depends on the sort of structure of that, that circuit that you're doing in space time. And you have to be clever about designing that in such a way that you're trying to foil it. 
But what this gives us in this prediction for these easy circuits, because they're only 14 things, we can actually run them on our, uh, on our classical computers. Uh, and we can run that verification. This, this first line here that I'm drawing here is just a very simple model that we have of sort of random errors that are not really interfering with each other. It's not a complex error model. That's what our model predicts. What we can do is we can run these full circuits uh, for 14 depth, and we can take this data uh, for the fidelity. We can run this game, and we can compare it to our model, and we see it's dropping sort of exactly as we expect. We also have these simplified circuits. We take the circuits that we're doing, we split it in half, and in the middle, we basically only do some of the two cubic gates, and that makes it easier to do this contraction. So we can verify that this is actually going down exactly as very, a very simple error model would predict. We're getting a non-zero fidelity here, right? We're 10 to the minus two. The error bars on these are actually very, they don't, they're not on this plot, but they're actually very small. Um, and just to give you an idea about the time scales involved here, to do this depth 14 circuit for the full circuit uh, for 53 qubits, where we get this fidelity of you know, 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the minus three or uh, ish, um, that takes about uh, five hours using a million cores, which it's nice to be at Google. You can just be like, oh, a million cores. Okay, I have that in my back pocket. Um, so so that's, that's, that's sort of the, the verifying that we're doing these circuits and they're working as we expected. And then what we do is we do the same thing, but now we go to depth 20. And at depth 20, because you can't, you have more depth, you can't do those other tricks as well. They start to fall apart. A lot of those tricks tend to scale exponentially in the depth. Um, and we can do that, and we can also do this trick where we cut it in the middle and do some of the, and don't do some of the things in the middle to make it easy. So if we, for the ones we do in the, in the middle uh, on the easy, we can actually plot, those are the green plots, uh, right? And then there's a model prediction. And then we can actually run the hard ones. And we don't know how to simulate these efficiently. We've, uh, you know, we've estimated how much we think it needs to do, which I'll show you on the next plot, but we believe it takes either a huge amount of memory uh, that's pretty infeasible or a huge amount of time. Um, so in the end, the supremacy type experiments that we're running are, are, are cycles of 20, so that's depth 40. Um, it means we have about 430 two qubit gates uh, and then about 1,000 single qubit gates. And our fidelity is you know, 0 0.2, uh, um, our predicted, that's our extrapolated fidelity that we're getting in this thing. So it's actually pretty good. We have to worry about statistical and also systematic fluctuations. And so there's, if you read the paper, there's huge sections on, on this discussion about why we think this is actually uh, enough accuracy to, to claim that we're doing this for, for these, these circuits. Okay, so now let me just tell you a little bit about the classical operation. So the point is, is we've now, for the depth 14, we verify that everything's working as expected. It matches perfectly. The quantum computer appears to be working at that. We've made the circuits longer by just six, you know, 12 more uh, uh, rounds, right? So depth 12 plus 12. We believe this is extremely hard. Um, the simulations that people do, uh, and I'll, I'm running out of time, so I'll, finish, I'll just skip this very quickly. They're sort of different types of simulations. They're sort of like simulating this way or doing that split effect. Um, and we've gone and talked to the world's best supercomputer uh, people who are running quantum simulations and challenged them to do this, including on Summit, which is now it's the, probably the best quantum computer, plus cl classical supercomputer that's in existence that we know about or that we can talk about, uh, right? And so here's some basic resource estimates we have for sort of this just evolve the wave function in time approach. Uh, in that one, the problem is that you run out of memory, essentially. Summit's RAM limit is here. Uh, and it, if you did have more RAM and you know, boosted it up, it would still take about two days to run this experiment. Remember our quantum circuit on the previous slide, if I didn't mention it, this took 200 seconds to run, right? So it's you know, pretty fast, uh, whereas it's two days here. If you're using these other simulations, which don't require as much RAM, uh, that sort of play this space-time trade-off. Uh, that's where this crazy estimate of if you sort of look at that we're below the summit li RAM limit, but we can do it, and it takes you know something like uh, you know 100,000 plus years for that type of simulation. Now, many of you may know that after we made our announcements, IBM came out. Uh, the reason we considered this infeasible was because uh, summit's RAM limit is here, and we thought, well, you could use disk, and it has about four times as much uh, disk in its entire. You know, it's not like they don't use the disk, <laughs> but in, in, its, in its file system. But the, power, the, the problem we ran into when we thought about that was, oh, it requires a lot of power to actually do that. And we didn't think actually Summit had enough 
power to do that type of work. Uh, but it turns out that Summit is also connected up to a nuclear power plant. <laughs> so, so quite literally, we went from this transition where the debate about simulating this quantum circuit, this quantum computation, went from discussions of things like everything that I'd ever run in my career while I was here at UW or anywhere else, I could do the quantum computation that was talked about in the lab on my laptop or a beefy desktop machine. Right? That was my career. And then in 2019, there was a transition where all of a sudden we could needed you know, a $200 million machine, and then it also turns out we probably needed a nuclear power plant in order to perform a simulation that does that. That's the supremacy event in my book, uh, and it's pretty awesome. I was literally at Google one day, and I got a request that said, we're getting data. We don't have enough compute power in order to, to simulate it. Can you get resources on Google's gigantic data centers of like, oh, I'm a software engineer, I can do that. And so I was the one who had got all the resources, like, yay, we ran the, all these distributed computations. But it was really cool to transition from desktop to chunks of Google needing to be able to simulate these systems. The data is available. If you want to try to simulate those circuits, go ahead and try it. <laughs> uh, this is the data. I'm running out of time. I want to let people get, it, get out the door. So it, you know, it's working as performed. We're super excited. Um, the big picture is that this is the first time we really are getting into a regime where it's hard, it appears to be hard to simulate this. There could be a breakthrough and that all falls apart. That would be awesome as well because then we'd be able to simulate larger quantum systems and chemists and physicists would rejoice. But we spent a lot of work knowing that we're pretty, we think we're very close to that regime. And our goal now is of course scaling this up more qubits and more depth, so better qubits, and that'll push even further in that regime where it just becomes impossible to, to run the simulations. The other thing that's going on here is this is the first time we built the entire system operating all at once. And that's a very different, uh, it's very different than just running single qubits, which is what a lot of, or a few qubit systems, which was a lot of the work that previously occurred has. And so there's an amazing amount of engineering that goes on here. I somehow transitioned from a theoretical quantum computing person to somebody who got really excited about engineering. So it's pretty awesome. Um, what's next? The eventual goal for quantum computing is a fault tolerant quantum computer that uses error correction. But now we have this device that there are certain computations that you can only run on this device. We want to explore what you can do with that. So that's my uh, day job. So my day job is I run the software team uh, that's trying to build the software that people can, can run experiments on our devices. Uh, these are two frameworks that we built uh, called CERC and Open Fermions. They're Python frameworks for writing quantum programs. We can use these to run on our devices. And you know, hopefully in the next year, you'll start to be able to get access to the machine and explore heuristically what you can do with this new computing capability. So I'm super excited because uh, my metric now is getting graduate students and postdocs onto these machines and trying out crazy things. And I think that's an exciting time to be in the field. Um, one final thing before I quit, which is that there's a lot of quantum computing going on in Seattle, which is awesome to see. Uh, many of you may have heard that just Amazon announced a service, which is awesome. Also a company called IonQ, which is a leading ion trap quantum computing company, is opening up in Seattle. There's a lot of stuff going on. Microsoft has been doing this here for a long time. Alibaba is also here, UW. Um, so the most important thing is that if you're interested in quantum computing, you don't have to drink beer, but you can come out to Quantum Beer Night, which we have th each th Thursday, uh, the first Thursday of each month. Send me an email, get on the list, and come out and just meet the people who are doing this in the, in the area, because it's an exciting time and there's lots of opportunities to jump in and contribute. Okay, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you for your time. All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, some people probably maybe have to leave, but yeah. we should probably take some questions. I think I was the only one asking questions. Yeah. <coughs> Just a question about time scales. You, you, meant, you, you mentioned like 10 microseconds to yeah. coherence time for the system. How many quantum gates can you fit into that? So our two qubit gates are about 15 nanoseconds. Our two qubit gates now are actually faster than our single qubit gates, which are about 20 nanoseconds. That's the, actually the first time that's ever occurred. In almost all systems, your two qubit interactions are slower because you have this tension about the speed of it is related to how much they're coupled, and you don't want to couple them too much. But because we can turn it off, we can actually make the two qubit gates faster than our single qubit gates. So about, so about, you know, it's about 20 nanoseconds. So the depth of the circuits, you can actually run really deep circuits if you're doing a few qubits before you hit that decoherence wall, which is about 10 microseconds. So 10 to 30, it just varies by qubit. Is there any, any 
ideas of how to improve that? Uh, yes, experience? lots of ideas. Uh, a lot of it has to do with fabrication and control of your materials, cleanliness and doing that. What we've kind of been lucky is that the transmon qubit has always been easy to get these sort of 10, people have done way longer decoherence times by using tricks. But because it wasn't our dominant effect, we didn't have to worry about that here. As we scale up, we're gonna have to start worrying about that. And so we'll focus on ways to either design new qubits that are interesting to protect our, our quantum information, or just the techniques people are learning to extend the lifetime. Um, the main source of decoherence are these things called TLSs, um, which because we have really c fine control of our systems, we can sort of map out what these things are and we can watch these really bad, they're little goblins that sit by our qubits and they're two level systems and they come by and sit at a frequency and then they hop over. And then if you're sitting here with your qubit, your qubit gets destroyed. And so we have a lot of control over that, which is kind of awesome. So it's a real fun game to try to calibrate these systems. When you're calculating the cross entropy, uh, is it that you're taking whatever circuit, uh, random circuit you have, you're simulating it on a classical computer and then you're sort of doing a density estimation to get the distri distribution and then comparing against that? Yeah, so you get the one from the classical world that's just a probability distribution and then you get your samples. Now when you get up to 53, you never see the same sample twice. So it's really just hitting the more frequent ones that you're pulling out when you're doing that, right? Because two to the 53 is big enough that you won't get a, you won't get a repeat when you run 10 million samples. So right? you mentioned that uh, like at some point you hit a barrier and you can't simulate the 53 qubit uh, yeah. system. So is there also a barrier to how well you can estimate the distribution using the classical algorithms? Because it sounds like you're, we're like trying to estimate the density of a quantum process. Like, is that also a barrier? The, I mean, that is the, the barrier that you're hitting is that the classical simula, the classical, doing that classical part, you can't do it for these depth 21, 20 circuits of, uh, efficiently. For the shorter ones, we can do it and we use that to verify. So we're sort of doing this game where we're like, we're going, walking up to the frontier as close as possible where we can use a supercomputer to calculate that wave function and do this comparison. But then we run circuits where we just don't know how to do that. And it's an unverifiable thing. We challenge people to simulate it. That's sort of the game that we're now playing. There are ideas for the next step, which is how do we do a, 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 a supremacy experiment where you can also verify that, you know, that you've done it. And that's another step, it'll probably be I, my guess is it's another few, a few more years before we get to that because those ideas right now are a little bit too hard for the current quantum computers. Okay, so maybe further questions offline because we're a little over time. Let's thank David again for an awesome talk.